our first speaker will be uh, Uwe Best, who is at the Delft Institute for Water uh, in Education, uh, UNESCO IHE, uh, in Delft. Um, she works on and has been presenting at the CSDMS meeting before and works on mangroves and interactions of vegetation um, with tidal sedimentation, wave surges, etc. And so I'll stop sharing and we'll give Uwe the floor for this. We are seeing your screen, but we're not. Yes, you're. Right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the bugs have been worked out. Okay, so thank you uh, for the introduction. And I also want to thank you for the opportunity of joining uh, the session for, for today. Um, Yes. <laughs> so I also want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity for uh, to join the session and I've been seeing quite a lot of in quite a lot of interesting presentations so I'm very happy to to hear about all of them so hello everyone uh, my name is Uwe Best and I am a PhD fellow here at the IHU Delft and TU Delft in the Netherlands I've been working with Mick van der Wegen um, Johan Reins, Dana Rulvink, all from IHG, as well as Jasper Dijkstra from the from Deltaris. And so today I really wanted to discuss with all of you uh, our approach taken in modeling the mangrove mudflat uh, dynamics and more so the capacity for such systems to be able to adapt to sea level rise. So in 2009, the government of Guyana attained uh, funds from the European Union and the IDB to evaluate the state of its sea defenses. And during this project, it was highlighted that the country's coastline had lost about 60,000 hectares, which is equivalent to about 600 square kilometers of mangrove coverage over, over the last 31 years. And this was attributed to a combination of both natural and anthropogenic factors, but more so uh, the, it's, it was attributed to the cyclic erosion and accretion patterns that are inherent to this particular system because of the alongshore movement of the mudflats. And so in 2009, the mangrove restoration and management unit uh, in collaboration with the ministry commenced among other measures the restoration of several stretches of, um, of, of mangrove fringes along the coastline and for today's uh, talk I will just focus on one of them uh, the the Chateau Margaret mangrove and this is along or this is located along the lower east coast of of the South American or of the Ghana uh, coastline. And here you can see an overview of what the area looked like in 2002, which was eight years prior to the restoration, and more so the development uh, and natural expansion of the area over the last 19 years. So it it has really been able to expand, and this is one of the uh, successful cases uh, of, of restoration within the country. And so last November, uh, we collaborated with the government of Guyana to monitor the effectiveness of the mangrove fringe, wherein we traveled with uh, instruments to capture the hydrodynamics and the sediment dynamics within the system and a total of 10 transects were established. However, in, in the figure, you're seeing the main transect along which the instruments were, were then established or, or set up. And 
the instruments were uh, then left there for about two months. Um, and so we've been able to capture lots of interesting, uh, interesting in information. And what we've also been able to do along the other transects or all of the transects is that we've been able to capture the vegetation properties. So the density, the diameter, the heights, and these are all attained manually using 10, 10 by 10 quadrants. And so from the data, I should also mention that we were able to capture a bathymetric survey extending six kilometers offshore. And so the system is really characterized by a combination of semi diurnal tides uh, ranging between one to two meters, swell and more so locally generated waves as well as, as currents. And we found that along the mud flat, the wave heights kind of ranged between uh, 0.5 to just about one meter. And most importantly, the mud flats were really showing capable of reducing or dampening the, the wave energy, in some cases by 50%. And within the mangrove, the wave heights were quite minimal. Uh, and we saw that they ranged between five to, five to 50 cent centimeters. So they were quite small. Yes, so we were more, interested in determining the extent and the presence of the infogravity waves along the South American coastline. Um, and we really wanted to see if the infogravity waves were able to reach the, uh, reach the intertidal zone and then to what extent uh, they, were, they were then seen within the, the mangrove belt. And what we noticed uh, was that um, there were there was a limited presence of the intergravity waves within the mangroves. They were more so seen along the mud flat, and you can see just from the figures that uh, the intergravity waves were really really quite small, and 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 they were probably between two point five to five centimeters, and so we can definitely conclude that uh, the intergravity waves are quite minimal, at least along this stretch of coastline. And so their impact on the sediment transport could also be quite, quite limited. And so we then developed using the data, a 2D high resolution depth average model uh, using Del 3D flexible mesh. And this was coupled to the vegetation module in Python through BMI. And so we have a coupled model that is now able to, to stimulate the development and, and the interaction of the flow, the waves, the sediment transport, the temporal and spatial variation in the mangrove growth, uh, and also the biomass accumulation. And just to give you an appreciation, we, we're only using one, uh, one open boundary through which we have the waves and the intertidal flow being Im imposed. And so now you have an appreciation for what happens with the development uh, of, of the mangrove vegetation from its establishment. Uh, and, and, and once it's been able to establish, you have the interaction between the inundation and the competition stresses, which limit the, the uh, establishment extent of the mangroves. And more so you have a system that is then able to uh, develop to some, some sort of, of equilibrium. And this continues for just about 160 years. And so we have a system uh, that, if compared to the typical uh, salt marsh, uh, we notice that the mangrove development uh, is much slower and um, equilibrium tends to extend to centuries. The spatial, uh, the spatial layout, the shoal patterns were all achieved within 200 years, and based on our quantitative validation, the, 
the results were satisfactory. And what we've seen also uh, that is quite crucial is that the waves uh, are definitely the main process, the main driver that brings the sediment into the intertidal area and then it's allowed to, to then be transported into the, into the mangroves during, during high tide. And so for this system, uh, we, even, uh, we even looked at the biomass impact. So we can see that uh, for systems with a below ground biomass uh, at attribution that exceeds two mm every year, uh, they're generally able to, to keep up with, with the sea level rise, as well as to just have a, 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 a constant increase in, 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 in the bed level. And so the last aspect of this that I really wanted to, to, to then sh share with you is the sea level rise. And so we decided to impose linearly increasing, decreasing rates, as well as an exponential in, in increase. And so for the linear approach, we can see that the rates ranged between well, one to 32 mm per, per year, and that the mangroves were seen to be quite resilient uh, against all rates except uh, those exceeding 25 mm. And under the 25 mm per year, the mangrove started to drown after 90 years when the water level exceeded 2.3 meters. Um, and so it was also similar to the scenario-based approaches where we also noticed that once the water level exceeded 2 to 2.3, meters the the system was no longer able to adapt and 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 respond and so we saw two things definitely the tipping points as well as a, a relationship between the sedimentation and the inundation depth and what we also found interesting was under the linear decreasing rates uh, there was a tipping point also noticed uh, for rate for rates less than two mm per per year, and so we definitely see that there is a particular range in which the mangrove uh, system is is able to adapt, is able to to develop. And so, in conclusion, uh, the main points is that we've been able to establish or develop a coupled two D model. Uh, that is able to represent the biogeomorphological development over 160 years, and further to expound uh, to see the impact of sea of sea level rise, and of course the initial uh, conditions for any model will then determine and play a significant role in the resilience of the overall system, and systems with a high uh, carbon content are definitely able to withstand the increases in sea level rise. So I hope it hasn't been too much, but I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. This is amazing work, uh, Uwe. I, I really enjoyed that you like showed us like a big update from like a year ago or so. Uh, and um, there's so much intricacy. Um, we will take one question, um, and I think that is going to be typical for most speakers that um, we can um, ask the questions in the chat. Um, maybe we maybe we can like ask the questions even while like the speaker. If you have like a really important question, like ask it while the speaker, because then we can like field them fairly quickly. But I'll take one question and yeah, convey it to Uwe. Okay, and I'll stop sharing now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to. Greg is raising his hand. Do I see others? Appropriately, Greg, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Uwe. That was fantastic. Uh, um, I especially appreciated your visualizations. It's really gorgeous visualizations. Um, yeah, thank you. 
I was curious about the, the kind of scalloped features that form in your simulations, or I don't know what the word for it is, but these sort of alternate bays and promontories. Can you tell us a little bit about those and why they form? Yes, uh, so we've been trying to establish um, uh, equilibrium bathymetry with the waves. With just tidal flow, you tend to not see the, the bays forming, but the waves generally have such a, such a, a large impact on, 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 on the directional flow. And so you definitely see um, the, the bays form. Um, what we've also been trying to, to establish is, uh, is to see whether um, just having the, either having just the short waves or, or just more, uh, more uh, intricacies in, in the swan. So once we have the triads and, and the other uh, elements being placed, you don't see the triad, the bay formation so much. Um, but it's definitely something that, that we're playing around with to see how to better represent what's happening. Um, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. Interesting. Yeah.